Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. On this podcast, we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about innovation. We've talked about the regulations that stifle innovation. But we've never talked about innovation with respect to art. We've also never actually explored art. Um, You might be thinking, Juliet, obviously we haven't. This is a podcast. You can't hear art. But today, on October 26th, 2022, I'm excited to host Diane Durante for a conversation about art and innovation in sculpture. She holds a Ph.D. in classics from the University of Cincinnati, and she's been a freelance writer, lecturer, and tour guide for over 30 years. She's written books on many topics, two of which include Innovators in Sculpture, which we're going to be talking about today, and Financial Programs of Alexander Hamilton, which hopefully I'll have her on for another time. Um, For more of her writings, go to dianedurantywriter.com. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Juliet. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we begin, um, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? Well, I have a thing. I don't want to make it sound as though it's directed at you because it applies to, I think, most people under age 50. So history matters, especially the ideas that drive the events. To me, not knowing history is like walking blindfolded into the New York City subway system. It is very, very dangerous. You don't know what's going on around you. You can't make an intelligent decision about what to do. You're at the mercy of anyone who shouts run. and You don't know which way to run or how far. I will give you a quick example. Suppose someone shouts that the U.S. is and always has been corrupted by systemic racism. And therefore, we have to overhaul the educational system, the economic system, law enforcement, and so on and so on. You can't judge that claim unless you know at least a bit about the Civil War, the KKK, Jim Crow laws, the civil rights movement. It's dangerous to support either side. It's dangerous to agree that this and this and this should be done unless you know the context, the historical context. And I mean, to add to that, you also kind of need to know about the founding. You need to know about the different ideologies that shaped the way our country was built, the ideas that even preceded the founding. I mean, there's a lot that you, a lot of context. Um, I I like the New York subway analogy. (laughs) Very clear. I I commuted on the New York City subway, and that was like the scariest thing I could think of. (laughs) New York subway blindfold. Ooh. Oh, no. I I can't even get around there without a blindfold. So, (laughs) okay, let's get into art. Why art? I mean, this is a government policy econ history podcast, so you're going to need to make the case for us. Why is art so important? Okay, first, I have to say what art is, because unless we agree on what we're talking about, it's not going to make sense. In my writings, I use Ayn Rand's definition of art, but I'm not going to recite that because it uses a lot of terms that just aren't familiar to most people. So I'm going to try and get to the same point in a different way. Suppose you get the phone number of the most attractive person in the room and you want to get his or her attention by a text message. And that cursor is blinking at you in that little blank box and you have billions of options, but you've only got one chance to get that person's attention. So what are you going to do? You're going to try and figure out what message you want to convey and put together the right words to get that message across. If you really want their attention, if you really want an interaction, you're not going to say something that's completely bizarre or they'll block you and be gone forever. You're not going to say, gee, this guy is a pretty blue today. Because why would you engage with someone who says that? (laughs) You're going to try for something unique and important, right? Yeah. Okay. So art is communication. And because it's communication from the artist to the viewer, 
The same thing applies to sculptors, even though their works take longer to create than a text message. So a sculptor is facing a big chunk of stone or a big mass of clay. He's going to choose a message that's unique and important, and he's going to try and choose details that will get that message across and that will keep your attention long enough for you to get the message. And that means that when he creates an artwork, he's going to try and say, this is important, this is possible, this is something you should pay attention to. Sometimes it's a person, an event, a feeling, sometimes it's a value, sometimes it's a characteristic. I know works that focus on courage or confidence or humility or love. And with that said, I can talk about what art does for us as viewers and why we would want to look at it. If you agree with what the artist says is important, then you can use that artwork to remember that important thing without a lot of words, just that image, and it reminds you. I like to say that it's like a signpost on the highway of your life. You're zooming along at 60 miles an hour. The artwork is not going to tell you where you want to go. It's not going to tell you why you want to go there. You need philosophy for those. But just by what it says, by what its message is, it can help keep you heading toward your chosen destination. Ayn Rand said an artwork is like a beacon raised over the dark crossroads of the world saying, this is possible. It's one of my favorite quotes. So art is both a visual reminder of your values and something that can give you the emotional fuel to pursue them because you see that that thing exists. And that is why we need art as much or more as we need economics and science and so on. Well, so in most disciplines, there's a lot of agreement, even though there's always some disagreement, for example, to use economics. Um, a lot of economists generally agree that price controls lead to shortages, free trade is good, and subsidies increase the price of subsidized goods, even if the implications or what we should do about it are not agreed upon. And I mean, this is a problem a lot of people have with Rand is that she thinks that there's an objective piece to art, but there's there's less of a general consensus on art. So why why do people disagree so much? And I don't, like, where does it come from? What does that mean? Well, there has never been before Ayn Rand a, a, a proper definition of art, what its genus is, what its differentia is. You get a lot of statements like art is whatever an art critic says it is, if he judges it. And a lot of art critics say that that's the the uh, definition of art. A lot of museum curators will say, well, if it's hanging on the wall in a museum, then it's art. A lot of people will say that art is whatever someone who calls himself an artist creates. And these are all very sloppy, mushy definitions. Uh, so there's a lot of disagreement on just what art is. And then there's disagreement on how you react to a certain piece of art because there's an objective content to it. Think of Michelangelo's David. Everybody knows what Michelangelo's David looks like. Uh, there, there is an objective content, the figure, he's standing in a certain way, his expression is a certain way. But suppose that Michelangelo's David looks exactly like the worst bully you knew in high school. It's going to be really hard for you to say, this is a great work of art and I love it. You may be able to say it's a great work of art, but you're not going to love that work. And there are other reasons besides something that concrete that you might disagree over. You might not think that what the artist is saying is important is actually important. You might just hate the style of the execution. I really, really hate a style called socialist realism, which was used in the USSR for decades. Um, can't stand it. Can't look at sculptures in that style. Don't want to. But the fact that I have that particular angle doesn't mean that art cannot be discussed rationally. It just means you have to dig into what, what's being implied 
that you're disagreeing with someone else on. Does that make sense? So you can have kind of a subjective view of art, but you have to acknowledge that there's a certain message being conveyed. Yes. Yes. That makes sense. And part of the, yeah, part of the problem with art history and art criticism for years is that there hasn't been a really sound, well thought out way of getting from what you see to concepts, to, to talking about it. And that's part of what I'm trying to do in the books that I write is get to the point where we can say, this is the message because this and this, and this, and this, like that, uh, portrait that we did in August in the class, the, uh, portrait of a merchant mm -hmm. in the, in the red, uh, I mean, if you, if you look at the details and then you put things together, you can come up with an objective message for that, but it's not easy. And there aren't that many places where you can go to find out how to do that. So I guess then we look to art history. Um, but why art history? Why, what's so valuable about looking at the history of art? Well, I would say that the, the main goal, if you're looking at it, is to find more art that you agree with, more art that you love, more art that inspires you. For every single person who's listening, there is at least one work of art already created in the world that just takes your breath away. You see it and you say, yes, that. Uh, looking at art history can help you find more of those. You can learn about the artists. You can learn about the periods. You can learn about styles. Uh, so I think the reason for doing an art history survey, the primary reason is to find more art that appeals to you. I have a personal reason for loving art history. And that's the fact that art history is what first got me interested in history proper. I was taught history proper in high school. It's just a series of names and dates and events. And you memorize them and then the test is over and then you forget them. And that's, that's what history was. But the summer after I graduated high school, my art teacher gave me Jansen's History of Art, which wasn't as huge at the time as it is now, but it's still a substantial book. Probably the, yeah, the largest book I'd ever read at that point. Jansen's History of Art includes parallel timelines. So you can see what's going on in politics, in religion and history, in science and technology, literature, architecture, sculpture, painting. You can see them all in parallel lines on facing pages. And I said, wow, there's actually a relationship between things like politics and religion and sculpture. I never knew that. Never got across to me in history classes. It was the first time I ever saw integration on that scale. And it was the first time I ever saw history as a series of choices that individuals made based on their ideas in a certain context. So for me, art history is the hook to the whole rest of history. I tend to remember historical periods by thinking of a major artwork because it says a lot about what the people of that time thought, what they considered important. Yeah, I mean, when I started getting into history, a lot of the time, I mean, it started with economic thought and political mm -hmm. thought. I loved learning, like, how did our government become what it is today mm -hmm. through, like, the different ideas that were circulating at different times, testing out what worked, what didn't, the clash of ideas. And in that sense, I mean, it is history, but yeah, it's a way of learning that now when I study for exams, for example, I look through the history of like economic thought for public choice, say, um, and I'm like, oh, so and so was so and so student. And so it makes sense because ah. what his work was a reflection and a response right. to his mentor's work and how mm -hmm. the ideas built upon each other and how that kind of leads to what we know now. It it's a right. way of organizing your thinking in a way that's also kind of interesting because I look at economists that have passed as like 
just, I don't know, they're just these giant figures in history. The way we study yeah. like Thomas Jefferson, but for me, it's like economics. Um, yes. But, okay, so you look at the history of sculpture through innovation specifically. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, well, obviously, that's such a good idea. But it must not have been an evident thing. How did you come upon that idea? And why did you decide to look at that? I can actually tell you exactly when I started working on my own history of art. It was in the summer of 2000, and I was going on my very first Mediterranean cruise with my family. And there were a lot of people on that cruise. I'd already had some art history. I'd been writing for 10 years or so on art history at that point. But there were a lot of people on that cruise who were paying a lot of money to go to Europe and tour museums and see works of art that they had never heard of. And they had no idea why they were important at all. So I said, I could do, I called it the crash cruise course. <laughs> Take it before you go on a Mediterranean tour or, or a tour of Europe. Uh, I thought I could do six or eight hours a survey of the highlights of Western sculpture and painting. And I did that, but it was kind of sprawling and there were a lot of concretes and it ended up being a lot of works that I liked and just ignoring the ones that I didn't like so much. So I, I tinkered with this and I toyed with it over the course of a couple of years. And eventually I decided I would change the focus and study progress in sculpture or painting by means of looking at major innovations. And as far as I know, no one had done this before. People will mention contraposto, uh, study of anatomy, some of the other things in art history textbooks, but they don't use it as a framework. Art history textbooks tend to be a concrete after another, after another, and they, they don't always even show you the connections between one artist and his students and, and how things change that way. Uh, so when I wrote Innovators in Sculpture and Innovators in Painting, they're about 150 pages each, and half of that probably is pictures. They're really just meant as a framework for looking at art, so you can go and research the parts that you actually like. When I think of innovations, I, I think a lot of like iPhones or CarPlay or all the stuff in the tech realm. Um, but what does an innovation in sculpture look like? What, what are the requirements for something to be an innovation? Well, I can tell you first what it's not. It's not just anything that's new. Like if I go out and say, I'm going to create sculptures out of egg cartons, that's not a major innovation. If I am the first person to sculpt a raccoon, not an innovation in the sense that I use. The definition of a major innovation depends on the fact that art is communication. The sculptor, I'll just say so, sculptor for ease of reference, he has to capture your attention. He has to show you something that's recognizable. Otherwise, it makes no sense and you'll go away. And he has to do something that's so vivid that you will stop and look at that particular artwork. So the way I sum it up is the sculptor has to make his viewers us uh, stop and look and think about his artwork. Each of the major innovations that I list in Innovators and Sculptor gives the sculptor, sculptor who creates it, more power to make people stop and look and think. And they're also so broadly useful that other artists adapt them. And then you have a lot of people adapting that, and then there will be another innovation moving on from it. So can you guide us briefly through the innovations that have occurred? I know there are a lot of them, but can you tell us maybe a few of the major ones and their significance? Yeah, um, this is really the point where illustrations would, I could show it to you, I could point to something and that would make it clear. It's tough to describe some of them quickly without illustrations, even though I'm waving my arms around and gesturing, <laughs> and, but you're not seeing that. So let me give you three examples. Uh, Egyptian sculptors, beginning, say, 
2500 BC, created life-size sculptures. And they always used the same type of body for men. And they always used the same pose, every figure. Around 600 BC, so that's what, 1900 years later, Greek sculptors began to show an interest in anatomy. And they would study ears and elbows and eyes and noses. As a result of studying anatomy, their sculptures look more lifelike. There's more variety, and therefore you want to stay and look at them longer. Because if you're looking in a room of Egyptian sculptures, you pretty much know what each of them is going to look like. But a room full of Greek sculptures, even 600, 550 BC, you're not going to be able to guess what the details will look like. Second example, uh, Greek sculptors through the 500s, 400s BC always showed faces that were very serene or maybe thoughtful, pensive. In the 300s BC, a Greek sculptor, we know his name, Scopas, started showing emotions on faces. And if you see a sculpture with an emotion, I mean, you may not have missed it before, but if you see one with an emotion, then you start wondering what this character is thinking, what, what emotions he's feeling. And that makes you stay and look longer, as opposed to a room full of sculptures where all the faces are very serene. One more example. Uh, in the 1600s, Bernini started doing these multimedia works he has sculpture, he has architecture, he has painting, he uses stained glass and light, and they're, they're absolutely stunning. It's like watching something in IMAX and surround sound for the first time, I suspect. You just look at it, and then you move a little bit, and you look at it some more, and you come at a different time of day, and it's different. It's, uh, it's another one of those amazing innovations that help the artist keep your attention and help you stay long enough to get the message that he's trying to convey. So that's three out of 11. And listeners, we'll put some pictures of those on the Adam Smith Works website on the post for this episode. So you can go ahead and take a look at that if you if you would like. I really highly recommend. Um, this being a government policy podcast, I want to talk about sculptures as propaganda a little bit, specifically mm. okay. Roman narrative reliefs. Could you tell us mm. about that type of sculpture a bit? Um, the Roman narrative reliefs are commissioned by the emperors, and they're meant to show the greatness of your rulers. Uh, because the Roman Empire, when they start these, is is pretty new. The Republic is over. The, the Empire is new. And you have to keep reminding people why, why it's worthwhile having this one ruler over all of us. Uh, so the emperors start doing these reliefs that show their great deeds. And it's not that the individual artist said, here's the message I want to convey. Here's how I'm going to convey it. Uh, things like Trajan's Column, which is a, an early-ish work under, under the empire. Uh, it's just a spiral of, of reliefs. I think it's the length of two base, two football fields. Yeah, it's and two it rises football about, fields. Yeah, and, and rises eight stories. There's no way you can actually read it. The, the purpose is not to teach you the story. And these wee little figures are not going to inspire you. They're not going to teach you any sort of values. Um, not that they should teach it. They, they don't reflect values. What they show is the emperor's importance. And um, they, the Christians rise under the early Roman Empire and adopt this, it's called didactic art. It's meant to teach you something. The Christians adopt it for medieval art. And so it lasts for a thousand years or so with where no artist is actually expressing his own uh, sense of what's important. He's, he's expressing what the church says is important and he's doing it in a way that will not get him burned at the stake. What or how has this sort of like propaganda esque narrative relief persisted over time. How is the existence of that and the creation of that influenced art and the tra trajectory of art generally? 
Well, uh, it's, it's dominant under the Roman Empire. It becomes adopted even for works that are not just glorifying the emperor. Last through the Middle Ages, kind of disappears for a bit in the Renaissance. And then it comes back in this, not as government propaganda, but it, it comes back with Rodin, the 19th century. And Rodin decides that you should, as viewers, you should see how he thinks rather than what he thinks. So he's, he's meant to, he's, he's meaning to teach you, not explaining this well, he's meaning to teach you about his process. He's, he's not choosing to, a message that's important and unique that he wants to deliver. He, he says, you know, I'm an artist and this is how I work. And you should just uh, realize that and be impressed. Can you give me a name so that I can look it up and see like a specific work and so that we can also show listeners? Uh, Rodin's Walking Man. Awesome. It has no head. It has no arms. He just picked up two pieces, um, models from his scope uh, from his uh, studio floor uh, whacked them together they're not even properly aligned and he cast it and he sold it and the art critic said oh it's fabulous but it's a headless armless not anatomically correct guy yeah i don't know if i would pay for that but you do you it's in it's in the metropolitan museum so who are we to argue Oh, I argue. I argue a lot. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not credential. I couldn't. I, I will argue that. I will. <laughs> you, are, you don't have to be credentialed to talk about whether art makes sense or not. So I guess then, and obviously the, the aim of the book is to expose non-credentialed people to this world and to the innovations. So... How does knowing the history of the innovation specifically, how does it understand, add to our understanding and appreciation of history and humanity and sculpture as opposed to just knowing the general history? Well, for me personally, I enjoy watching competence. Extreme competence just makes me really happy. Seeing progress makes me really happy. I will sit and watch a video, you know, the one of the container ships being loaded, done, unloaded, and going around. It's night, it's day. There, it, it's so efficient. I I will sit and watch the hairdressers do an expert cut. I will watch actors rehearsing until they get the nuance just right. I will watch chefs chopping things up, and if you know what to look for, then art can be art history can be a lot like that. You can see man progressing and just getting better at something in a very specific realm. Where do you think that innovations will take art in the future? I, I know that question seems kind of impossible <laughs> because the nature of innovations is one where you can't really see it coming. Yes. But what do you think? I really can't guess, but I would say do you, have you heard of the adjacent possible? Vaguely. It's okay. It's like you, you know, a lot of stuff at the very uh, forefront, very edge of what that particular field is doing. And knowing all of that makes it much more likely that you're going to make the next jump, advance the knowledge in that field. So if you, you know, I don't know my technology examples well enough to do this, really. But if Alexander Graham Bell had known nothing about uh, audio train, now that's not a good example. Uh, let me think what else. Well, make it absurd. A two-year-old is not going to figure out how to do gene splicing. He doesn't know enough. A college student in biology is not going to say, oh, this is how you do it. But somebody who's been working for years and knows all of the variations, knows all of the research, is thoroughly familiar with it, 
he can make the leap to the adjacent possible. He can make the jump. So with respect to innovations in art, it's going to have to be somebody who really knows all the previous innovations. Otherwise, you're just reinventing the wheel and your life is going to be over before you finish reinventing the wheel. So I have no idea what they are. I wouldn't be surprised if there are some, but I have no idea what they are. Who are the main consumers of art and sponsors of art? And how does that influence the art that is produced? Well, it depends entirely on what century or millennium you're talking about and what country to some extent. I guess uh, it was it was a big I, I guess brief survey and then today um well or whatever the Egyptians you think. okay um let me take it just cover the civilizations that are in innovator sense culture mm -hmm. in the under the Egyptian pharaohs the art was done for the pharaohs maybe some of the high officials that's who sponsored it they had very tight control over the models that were used, they, there was a grid system. So everybody had exactly the same proportions. The Greeks, you know, it's hard to say what some of the, the Greeks would do, uh, private individuals would dedicate sculptures, say to a, to a temple uh, or in a graveyard. There is much more freedom among the Greeks to do something completely different. There's no overarching imperial power that can tell them, just stay where you are and do what you're doing. Under the Romans, I think the biggest market was probably the wealthy. And one thing the Romans did very well was keep the trade routes open, keep the empire safe so that there was a lot of trade in the early years of the empire. There are a lot of wealthy people and they buy copies of Greek sculptures, which is why we know most of these sculptures, because the original bronzes have long been lost. Uh, but the Romans have made thousands of copies. And then you get to the Middle Ages, where everyone is so dirt poor that the only people who are buying art, the church is the biggest, and the some of the high nobles, but even, you know, the high nobles at that time are living pretty lousy lives compared to a 21st century American. Uh, the Renaissance, you start seeing a buildup of wealth again. Uh, so there's still art that's paid for by the church, but there's also a lot of art paid for by private individuals. And you start having a much broader range of subjects again. Uh, coming into Baroque, same thing. Uh, 19th century industrial revolution is fantastic for art because there's so much more wealth around uh, and people want to live nicely when they're making a lot of money, right? So 19th century, 20th century, there are much more, many more private individuals uh, who can afford art and probably far fewer works are sponsored by the uh, the government, depending on what country you're in, of course. Um, let's see. So I think I think that's we're we're at the point now where there are enough wealthy individuals that they can commission art or buy art. If you see something that you really like and you can afford it, then you just go out and buy it. And I mean, there's still a lot of money coming from the government in art. Um, in, in 2019, yeah. there was $1.4 billion distributed at the local, state, and federal level in the yeah. United States, which is a lot. Uh, and so much of it is crap. So much of what they sponsor it would not be paid for by any private individual. Well, yeah. Really, it would not. So in the sciences, you see a lot of the time that that sort of spending, even if there is private spending dictates the topics mm -hmm. that are focused on and what areas are explored and researched. Um, mm -hmm. Because in addition to maybe getting private funding, you can also get government funding or you can just be government right. funded instead of privately funded. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so there, even though there's a lot of private investment in art, do you do you see the influence of government? Like you say, it's all crap. But like, what is what is the difference? Maybe. Um, if you offer someone a very large amount of money and you say, "Well, do do whatever strikes your fancy," uh, actually, this is exactly what happened with Rodin. Rodin was given a government grant to design a huge doorway uh, for a museum. (laughs) And he was on the government payroll for, uh, I think, 37 years? Wow. For a very, very long time. And this is the period, because he was was good. He knew his anatomy. If you look at his early works, they're good. But he doesn't have to worry about paying the rent. So he can do anything he damn well pleases. Uh, and it it has a horrible impact. I, I would say that the uh, as much as the government, the art critics, and what they praise are affecting what what is done in modern art, especially abstract art. Um, if people were just allowed to judge themselves, I don't think that most of modern art would um, would be produced so yeah yeah and to me that makes the case that there should be a uh, private money not just money generally well money but yeah. like private money in in art and in science and those sorts of fields because it does hold things to a certain standard of relevancy is maybe yeah. not the right word to use but it's the only one that kind of occurs to me at this moment it keeps it tied somehow to the to the market, to the purpose for which it's being created. You don't create art just to have something to take up the empty plaza in front of your new skyscraper. If it doesn't say something, it it shouldn't be there. Or call it decorative art if you must, but it's it's not art per se. Yeah. Um, so one final question before the final question: <laughs> What is your favorite? sculpture or work of art or both? Um, and then we'll put this up so people can look at them. I would just love to know. Hmm. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. I have before this, I, I have done lists of my favorites, which I could dig out for you, but a lot depends on my mood on a particular day on, on what kind of, um, encouragement, what kind of emotional fuel I need so I, I couldn't say that there's one top, top favorite, but I have many, many works that I, I would love to own. <laughs> yeah, I love going to museums and asking people, would you put this in your house? It's my favorite yeah. question. People yeah. always look at me like I'm crazy. This summer we went on a museum tour and I was like, would you put this in your house? It was like this giant painting that took up an entire wall. And mm-hmm. the girl just like looks at me and she's like, would, this wouldn't fit in my house. And I'm like, but if it did. <laughs> Would you want it? Play along with the hypothetical. A, yes. Um, I like to go in a museum and uh, go with my husband and we will each go around a gallery separately. And then we, we meet and we say which painting or sculpture was our favorite. We very seldom agree. But it's, it's just fascinating. You learn so much by saying, which one's your favorite? I love art. I want to go to a museum like right now, but I have school. So (laughs) um, I have one last question for you. What is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? Okay. This was fun to think about. And here's the answer. I have loved writing since I was in first grade. I won an award for writing a little, you know, five line essay about why I liked the firemen coming to give us rides on their fire engine. And I was hooked. So I used to believe that if I found exactly, precisely the right facts, the right arguments, the right words, then anybody who read or heard those words would get it. They would understand and they would agree with what I was saying. So it's just a matter of working hard enough to get the right words. 
So if I wrote a book like Innovators in Sculpture or the financial programs of Alexander Hamilton and made all the ideas clear and I made all the consequences of these ideas clear, then everybody who reads it is just going to say, well, <laughs> hallelujah and amen, right? But I have come to realize that you really can't change a mind unless you're engaging with it. And engaging usually means I'm not just presenting my point of view. I'm trying to find out the other person's state of knowledge and its context, trying to see what we agree on, see if we can move toward further agreement. It's not always possible, but one-on-one -on -one going back and forth is, is really the best way to do it if the other person matters to you and you want to change their mind. So the lesson is I can't dispense wisdom and impose agreement from the top down. Has to be a discussion. Has to be an agreement. There's a there's a marketplace of of ideas and consensuses that arise as equilibriums. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to be on my podcast and oh, you're very welcome uh, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. I mean, I've I've loved talking about this. And listeners, go engage with the book. Um, it might be easier to like look <laughs> at it. You know. Definitely. Pictures. Pictures are good. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest for their time and insight. And I'd like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at gmail.com. Thank you.